if you make a compost tea or 420 or some other inoculum, never, ever put it out by itself because you've wasted a tremendous opportunity. Uh, and I've actually patented the term uh, globally, MEND, and that's why it's got the registered trademarks on it. MEND means microbially enhanced nutrient delivery. And this is a recognition of the power of putting microbes behind minerals. Now, the first thing that alerted me to, to this was actually an ex-Brookside consultant working for Doctors Without Borders uh, in um, Western Africa. Uh, and he's saying, OK, I understand the idea. You do a soil test. You need The soil test tells you exactly what you need, a Brookside test. Uh, you need two tonnes of lime. You need 250 kilos of pot sulphate, uh, 25 kilos of zinc, 15 kilos of copper, and 15 kilos of boron. But what's the point of that, uh, having that kind of precision, in the third world where people haven't got two cents to rub together. So he said, I wonder what would happen if we took 10%, exactly that ratio, but just 10% of it, and composted it. And someone funded them on 17 sites across West Africa um, to test this concept. Uh, and I'm not sure who did. I never found, saw that in the article I read. Um, and so the concept was, OK, so instead of two tonnes, it's 200 kilograms of lime. Uh, instead of 250 kilos of pot sulphate, 25. Instead of 25 of zinc, 2.5. Instead of 15 of borax and, borax and, and copper, uh, 1.5 kilograms combined with whatever you could find locally to compost. And then they did the trials with the full amount on small areas, like half acre areas, versus 10% with the microbes, with the, with the microbes behind the minerals. And in every block, without exception, the microbes uh, behind the minerals, the compost with that 10% outperformed the full amount. And I realised, oh my goodness, this is a fairly big principle here. Uh, putting the microbes behind the minerals. So you never ever put out a compost tea by itself because you've wasted, so say you're going to spray it on a leaf because you're trying to control downy mildew on cucurbits, for example. Here's the deal, it's easy to imagine. The underside of this leaf is covered in tiny little spores. Uh, the roots and the organisms around the roots are sucking in oxygen, breathing out CO2, it's diffusing up and these little mouths are catching it. Now the story is that these little stomates, the little mouths, can open up to seven times their normal size. And there's certain things that govern stomatal opening. Number one, potassium. There's a big reason to not let potassium run out in your crop because stomatal opening is governed by potassium and you won't photosynthesize very well in the absence of potassium. Number, number two is quite fascinating. There's a woman called Rachel Carson who wrote a book that changed the world. And you can read that book today and, sorry, and be amazed at the poignancy and the brilliance of her writing. And that one woman... Uh, she wrote a book called Silent Spring because there was whole areas in the US where there were no birds. That's what the Silent Spring was about at the height of the use of DDT. It killed, completely killed birds in certain regions. So there was no noise of springtime of birds uh, and their chorus. So uh, the fascinating, and of course her book impacted so many people that she single-handedly led to the banning of DDT. Politicians read it. It was the number one New York Times bestseller uh, and eventually... Uh, on the basis of that impetus that she started, we banned DDT globally. Now, the interesting thing about that period where there were no birds was that production fell away during that time. And people said, well, how the hell could birds have anything to do with how a grapevine or how a cucumber or whatever produced? How could there be any link? Uh, and then they, you know, birds drop a couple of droppings as they fly over, and then they discovered it. They discovered that those stomates that can open seven times their normal size are wide open every morning because there's dew and there's a bit of dust, that's minerals, on the dew, and the plant opens up to have a feed. But the opening is stimulated by the frequency of birdsong. The early morning bird, bird chorus, we're all going for it, opens up the stomate and the plant has a drink and a feed. And in the absence of the birds, there was a fall off in production with what they missed out on. So nature, wonderful interrelated thing, and we can work with it. We can find out that if we're going to spray foliar nutrients, we do it early in the morning, we do it in the late afternoon or in the evening, so it'll be there in the dew to be sucked up, never in the middle of the day, it's a waste of time because the stomates are closed, but we work with that principle. But the third thing that opens these little mouths up to suck up the CO2 and photosynthesise is the mere sudden influx of large amounts of CO2. You just sprayed 100 litres of compost tea, there's 5 billion in a teaspoon, you just put out a trillion trillion bugs, all of whom are sucking in oxygen and breathing out CO2 in the plant, when you smother the leaf, says, oh my God, I'm having this, woof, and opens its mouth up, and you put much less than you'd normally use of whatever nutrients required for that plant. In this case, this, is, uh, this has got massive, it's got 340 parts per million of phosphorus, and it's always zinc deficient, because phosphorus shuts down zinc. 
Uh, and so they often, you know, obviously every 10 days they've got to spray 5 litres per hectare. This is not a hectare, but 5 litres equivalent of zinc. They spray 1 litre with compost tea, does the same job. That's a big saving. There's 80% reduction because you knew how to work with nature rather than against her. And that's very much how the science of this thing can work for you.